Good morning. My name is Mike Patel. Um, I'm going to present on the double aortic arch and um, a case that we presented with uh, at the Swedish uh, Medical Institute uh, in the neurovascular department. Um, I had um, a chance to research uh, the different variants of the aortic arch and what it meant for this um, patient that came in. Um, so I'm going to discuss a basic overview of the different architectures, uh, the architecture of the aortic arch, and then also go in through our case presentation. Um, so here are the contents of my presentation. We're going to speak of the common variant, um, which is normal in about a majority of the population. We're going to discuss other variations of the aortic arch. Um, we're going to discuss some clinical findings specifically with um, the double aortic arch, the causes, um, the diagnostic criteria, the treatment, and then we'll go into the, the actual case presentation and intervention that we discussed or that we used. So here we have the common aortic arch. Um, <clears throat> you can see that uh, it's a continuation of the ascend ascending aorta from the left ventricle, um, where it branches first into a brachiocephalic artery on the right, and that further bifurcates into the subclavian artery in the right common carotid. Um, then the next one, you have the left common carotid artery and a left subclavian artery. According to um, the Bergman Atlas, um, this normal variation is um, actually uh, present in 80% of the population. Um, that's why it's widely accepted as the norm or a common variant. So here are the different aortic arches that we will discuss um, the variants. Um, specifically focusing on the double aortic arch. Um, another well-known um, variant is a bovine aortic arch, um, then a barrent branching aortic arch, and a pulmonary sling and a right-sided aortic arch. Um, <clears throat> the double aortic arch is also known as a vascular sling and an, or a ring due to its compressive nature um, from the posterior and the anterior arches. Um, which cause the tracheo and tracheoesophageal structures to be compressed. Um, another variant that I want to speak about right now is the right-sided aor aortic arch, which is just a mirror image of the left variant, um, but just completely on the opposite side with the same branching patterns. Um, <clears throat> Let's go into the bovine aortic arch. Um, so here we see the bovine aortic arch in the, as it presents in humans on the left side. And then on the right side, we actually see a bovine aortic arch. Um, so a lot of uh, literature has been presented uh, into the, um, the use or the term bovine aortic arch as they don't really resemble um, many similarities between the two. Um, you can see that on the human bovine aortic arch, you have the innominant artery, um, which contains a brachiocephalic trunk on the right side, as well as a left common, or left common carotid artery. So as opposed to on this side, where you have a bicarotid trunk, and everything just stems from one um, branch on the aortic arch. <clears throat> Here's a. a Aberrant branching. Um, there's many different types of aberrant branching, but um, I chose to focus on um, the right-sided one in the picture, which is where the right subclavian artery comes out distally to the left subclavian and then wraps behind the tracheoesophageal structures and would cause compressive symptoms um, posteriorly, um, um, which would most likely be the esophagus. Um, then we also have as mentioned in the slide, we have a left vertebral artery, which instead of arising from the um, from the left left subclavian right here, it would just come out distally, or actually in between the left common carotid and left subclavian. Only sometimes it comes out um, as the fourth one in this aortic arch. Um, so. Let's get into the specific uh, specific arch of double double aortic arch. Um, <clears throat> we see two arches from the ascending aorta. Um, this is an actual 3D image of the um, patient that presented to Swedish, um, and you can see that the ascending aorta aortic arch comes 
in right here and then splits into a posterior right side and an anterior left side. And then you have two uh, branches that come off of both sides. Here's the right common carotid coming from the right, uh, right posterior arch and a left subclavian, which is a little bit harder to see. Um, and then on the left side, you have the same left common carotid and a left <coughs> subclavian. And then they meet up again um, to form a descending aortic arch, which goes into the thoracic cavity. Um, you can see why this would cause some compression. Um, the trachea and the esophagus are right in this area, the circular um, space. Um, it's been removed in this uh, 3D rendered image um, just for, I guess, better view of the architecture of the arches. Um, <clears throat> so the causes here, um, mainly an embryological cause um, is what creates this double aortic arch. The mechanism is understood, but not really certain why it occurs. Um, specific to the art, double aortic arch, we have um, primitive um, remodeling of the aortic arch, the fourth, uh, fourth branch. Um, the right side um, fails to regress, causing a posterior branch to form, um, while the left side remains and creates the anterior branch of the aortic arch. <clears throat> Other variants um, are caused by the same failed regression or um, regression of different parts of the fourth primitive arch. Um, sometimes they also reference a third primitive arch and, um, and the sixth one. Here are some of the clinical findings that you'd see um, with double aortic arch. Um, you'd see respiratory symptoms, which include strider, infections, respiratory disease, or distress, uh, wheezing, and cough. And on the esophageal side, you'd see dysphagia, feeding difficulty, and vomiting. Um, usually, these, these symptoms present in uh, younger patients um, because the congenital um, um, arching is already present at birth, and um, it would be it would be more common to see it beginning our symptoms beginning are more towards the early stages of life. But you can also have a wide range of other symptoms mm -hmm. where you might present with no symptoms at all. Um, so for diagnostic criteria, you want to start off with the plain radiographs. Um, it's very, it's a very rare um, anomaly to have the double aortic arch. Um, as I said, 80% have a normal variant, according to the Bergman Atlas. Um, but if you're a clinician and you're suspicious of um, a younger patient presenting with any of the symptoms that we saw earlier, um, you want to keep this in the back of your mind. Um, but you want to start off with plain, plain radiographs to, you know, rule out other causes of um, respiratory distress and um, esophageal symptoms first. Um, probably start off with the anterior and lateral view um, on plain radiographs. Um, after that, the best um, actual, actually the best uh, diagnostic study is a CT or MRA. Um, the only um, downfalls for the CT is that it um, exposes the children to ionizing radiation. Um, and for MRA, the downfalls are that it actually takes a long time to get those imaging, uh, actually it takes a long time to get the imaging done. So for kids, you can see that that would be a problem, um, just having them in an MRA machine. Um, echocardiograph doesn't really f uh, give you a full um, overview of the architect architecture of the double aortic arch. Um, so it's not very um, effective as a diagnostic study. Um, bronchoscopy and barium swallow are very invasive tests, um, so you can see why that would be difficult to perform in children. Um, you can also only um, recognize where the obstruction is happening with bronchoscopy in the um, trachea and for the barium swallow in the esophagus, um, but you wouldn't get an overview of the actual double, double aortic arch and what the architecture looks like. Um, so for treatment purposes, there is no real um, uh, I guess uh, there isn't any um, treatment besides surgical uh, treatment. Uh, you want to perform it soon after diagnosis um, just to prevent any complications from the double aortic arch. Um, 
specific to the surgical intervention, um, the arch is divided, um, mostly at a portion where it's atretic or um, it's a small, it's smaller in formation. So this usually ends up being the left side, which is the anterior side, and where it attaches to the, um, the descending aorta. Um, you also want to make sure that um, you do this under vascular clamping, proximal and distal to both sections, um, and also assess for carotid pulses and radial pulses while you're doing the intraoperative uh, intervention for um, resection. Um, other things you want to make sure to avoid while you're doing the operation are the vagus nerve, which is an important structure that passes here, and also the current um, laryngeal nerve. So here's the case presentation that we saw. Um, it was a 71-year-old male presented with symptoms post-trans um, ischemic attack. Um, the MRI, an MRI was done, and it displayed an aneurysm in the left pica, which is a posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Um, they did a CTA to confirm the pica um, and pica aneurysm and revealed that a double aortic arch was present. Um, this patient had no history of respiratory or esophageal complaints, um, which is quite interesting because he was 71 and with such a um, such a compressive structure that he never had any symptoms in his life was um, kind of amazing. Um, here's an oblique 3D reconstructed CT image of the patient. Um, <clears throat> this gives you a better angle of viewing the right subclavian right here coming off the right posterior branch. Then you have the uh, right common carotid right here coming off the right and on the left side. Um, again, the trachea and the esophagus are removed in this um, 3D rendered image. And here's the inferior view um, that was taken. You can see that this is the ascending portion. Um, this side is most likely, uh, this is the anterior portion of the arch and I guess you can't really see um, the right continuing as well, but this is the opening to the right aortic arch. And on this side, we have the descending part. Um, again, this is a space where the trachea and esophagus will lie, the trachea a little bit more anterior and the esophagus posteriorly. So um, the intervention, um, for this patient was a stent placement for the peak aneurysm, but um, due to the complicated nature of the double aortic arch, um, the normal femoral artery access was avoided um, just due to how difficult it would be to approach the, the pica from this, um, from this side. If you went through the femoral artery, you'd have to go through the external iliac into the common iliac and then up the aorta, and then you'd have to actually maneuver to try to get into the anterior portion of the aortic arch um, in this patient, and then make a acute right angle superiorly to try to get into the vertebral artery from there. Um, so instead of using that approach, um, the surgeons used the left radial artery approach, which gave them direct access to the left subclavian and then into the left vertebral artery. Um, a stent that was placed was a flow diverting stent, which um, after placing the stent was um, seen immediately um, effective in reducing the blood flow into the pica aneurysm. Um, and that's it for my presentation. Um, thank you so much. Here are my references. Um, and have a good day.